television highlights of the news of yesteryear. Britain's General Allenby of Near East Command in 1917, as Balfour Declaration gives renewed hope to Jews of promised land. In months that follow, with ink on Balfour Pact still wet as waves, these waves of the Mediterranean Sea, Jews pour into the wasted and sandy acres of ancient Palestine, a home of their own at last. But blossoms will bloom in desert if toil and trouble can do what nature has not done. Out of sun-dried earth the first year, here comes the meager harvest. Hotland parasites and pests will not contaminate this second laboriously planted crop. Where there was last year nothing but miles of waste, a people's gardens grow. And out of the land of sand, barren and abandoned to a burning sky, the seeds of a city bloom. The machinery of modern times is missing, but strength is not. And soon a city of 40,000 people shines in the desert sun where there was nothing but wind and sand before. And they call it Tel Aviv. In New York City in May of 48, American Jewry joins the freedom-loving peoples of the world to celebrate the thrilling news. United Nations laws have established Palestine as a free and independent state to be known as Israel. And there's one bold star on a brave new flag waving among the proud banners of free nations. But bounded on all sides by hostile Arab states, Israel calls its world's newest nationals to arms, for infant Israel is threatened with brevity and the breaking of a promise that couldn't keep. With Arab invasion imminent, Haganah troops abandon underground activities to train for open war. First Arab attacks are fierce, and tribal troops make quick work of conquest in old Jerusalem. Ancient metropolis of Holy Land would not yield to ravages of time, but savage assault by attacking Arabs turns the sun-baked city into a broken, burned-out battlefield. Looting follows the Arab smash, as new home of once homeless Jews becomes a grab bag of victory, and rubbish burns in the battle-ruined streets. Proudly surveying captured Jerusalem is tribal potentate Glub Pasha, looking at ruins around him with probably eye to what the rest of infant Israel will look like when Arab troops attack again. But Jewish troops still hold their new one home. And there is promise that they'll keep what they still have as Count Folk Bernadotte of Sweden and the United Nations effects a truce. On Isle of Rhodes in 1949, Count Bernadotte is mortal angel of hope to those who wait for calm, fair, and friendly end of differences in Holy Land. But assassins only wait with guns. The cannon of war are stilled by the days of truce, but Arab invaded Israel is not quiet. Here's David Ben-Gurion, new nation's prime minister, who solemnly reminds his people the truces don't last forever. But with renewal of hostilities, Haganah troops hit invading Arabs hard, and every armed encounter is victory for Israel. Hundreds of marauding Arab soldiers are suddenly peace-loving prisoners of war, and are grateful for the kindness and generosity of the victorious Israeli soldiers. Tribesmen who would have wrecked the infant state are fed because the new nation is too strong for destruction. With Israel's strength now making lasting peace a possibility, the ailing Dr. Kaim Wiseman takes office as the new nation's first president. Called from the United States to lead newborn Israel in problems of peace, 
Zionism's elder statesman at long last sees his years old dreams of a promised land come true. Now the ancient wanderers will have a home. And helping to make that home secure, here's Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Ralph Bunch of the United States and the United Nations. His plans for settlement of Holy Land dispute gives Jews at last a piece of earth and patch of sky that they can call their own. December 1929, and in Bremen, Germany, this propeller-powered motorboat goes 65 miles an hour with crew and passenger list of 25. If you know a plane that's lost its fuselage, well, here it is. And if you know a plane that won't rise from water, here it is. But driven by ordinary outboard motor, it's not supposed to fly except across surface of water and it makes speed 15 miles faster than swiftest ordinary boat with outboard drive. The place, Alameda, California. The time, 10th of January, 1930. The boat, one of the wonders of yesteryear. Inspector Daniels. With America in toils of World War I, United States Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels invades Hampton Roads, Virginia on inspection tour of the Atlantic Fleet. Serving under President Woodrow Wilson, Daniels had assistant secretary named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. La Russell rustles up Marines. During First World War, the fabulous Lillian Russell makes one of her most important Broadway appearances in role of soldier of the sea, first woman to be so honored by the Corps. Miss Russell shakes the hands of a civilian now under arms. It's 1929, and in nation's capital, visiting Prime Minister of England, Ramsay MacDonald, gets an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from George Washington University, from University President Dr. Lloyd Marvin, Ramsay MacDonald, Prime Minister of England between the wars. It's late 1930s, and near Kawachi, Japan, seven persons are dead in torn and twisted wreckage of Far East Limited, pride of Japanese rails. Leaping from trestle at 60 miles an hour, engine pulls five of 13 car train into the ravine below. 200 persons are injured, many seriously, but miracle of accident is that mishap was fatal to only seven. It's worst accident in history of railroading in land of rising sun, but sun could have set for a lot more people than it did. May 1929, and here's Bill Williams at foot of 16-mile road up Colorado's Pikes Peak. Williams is not giving expert demonstration on how to be a thoroughgoing highway inspector. He's out to win $1,500 by pushing a peanut to the top of the mountain with his nose. And he did it in 22 harrowing days. In the 1920s, airmen at Marshall, Missouri make experiments in refueling planes in flight. With five-gallon cans of gasoline attached to pickup apparatus on flying field, plane in need of fuel comes in and the can of precious liquid goes up for grabs. At Los Angeles, California in middle 20s, flyers seeking membership in the Black Cat Society of Daredevils prove that they have nine lives. With candidates for black cat hanging from wingtips, plane roars low over field at 100 miles an hour. If he grabs that hat, he's elected to the club. He 
changed elected, but will he live to hold office? Bland Hotel. Complete with walking sticks, this well-dressed twosome of the middle 20s signs for hotel rooms that should be padded cells. Cloche hats, wide ribbons, and long silk scarves seem to be the last word in fashion. And we're surprised that the last word in this elevator isn't going down. This must be a swank hotel, because the lovely in that leopard coat certainly ought to know all the spots. Notice latticework door. Our well-draped beauty swings a wicked shawl. The shawl and leopard coat have gone the way of all excess clothing for a few moments in the hotel garden this warm summer afternoon. The gentleman no doubt escaped from behind those barred windows in the background to point out sights to a couple of sights of the middle 1920s. Zabisco, leading wrestler of the 20s, and here he is demonstrating his deadly and destructive flying mare. Have you ever seen a horse fly? Well, you just did. And here, Vladek shows how to clip an opponent with his twin razored flying scissors, the old cut up. Here's a closer look at an old-time legitimate bone crusher slowly but surely squeezing his opponent into two unequal parts. Vladek is superior to two men, and we don't mean Lake Superior either, for this guy's rougher than a stormy sea. 